this PowerPoint presentation or literature review will be focusing on the Eating Attitudes Test scale or the EAT26. The reason that I've chosen this scale is because both in my personal life and in my work life, I've come across a lot of individuals who have struggled with an eating disorder. Most commonly, those disorders have been anorexia nervosa and bulimia. While this scale doesn't completely predict an eating disorder, I still think it's a useful scale to use. Due to these reasons, I was really interested in learning the reliability and validity of this scale. The Eating Attitudes Test, or the EAT26, is actually based off an original scale called the EAT40. In the original scale, there was actually 14 items that were deemed unnecessary, so they were cut off, and that is why it's now called the EAT26. Nowadays, the EAT26 is actually one of the most widely used tests to assess eating disorder risk, but as stated, it's more so to assess behaviors rather than specifically diagnose or replace professional consultation. When in use, the EAT26 scale is a 26-item self-report questionnaire. Individuals given this questionnaire will first fill out personal information, which will include indicating if they are male or female, what their age is, what their current BMI is, their weight history, and the percentage of ideal body weight. Once they filled out all that information, they move on to the target questions. The questions are marked responses, indicating whether you agree or disagree with the statements given. The way that professionals score these questionnaires is that if an individual score is greater than 20, they require further investigation. They will also take in the individual's current BMI, the percentage of ideal body weight, and weight history that they indicated on their personal information. This scale also has a specific scoring system, which you can see on the right, which indicates how they score questions 1 through 25, and then question number 26. In terms of demographics, the EAT26 scale can assess ages 13 and up, though in many studies the ages are 18 plus individuals. There is actually a EAT26 scale used for younger children called the CHEAT26 scale, which is used for ages 8 through 13. Overall, this scale can be used on both men and women, though more regularly used to assess women. This scale has also been used on many diverse populations, in terms of reliability and validity, the E26 scale in a non-clinical setting needs to be further evaluated. The reason that they were looking into this issue is because of its factor structure. And the factor structure is usually described as a correlational relationship between a number of variables that are said to measure a particular construct. So for this study, they wanted to assess whether certain variables were working as a group to assess certain constructs like social pressures. Using a bifactorial structure, they did find that specific factors capture unique domains of eating pathology and that the EAT26 in a non-clinical setting needs to be further assessed in a clinical sample. So this is a picture from the last study that shows how the factor structures were used. As you can see, certain items were grouped together to form bigger constructs. And overall, the findings were pretty significant with social pressure being 0.77, food awareness being 0.82, bulimia being 0.70, and food preoccupation being 0.86. You can also see that there was a relation between bulimia and food preoccupation with 0.32%. A study which looked at the reliability and validity in racial groups also found that even amongst different diverse populations, of the E26 in general was pretty good at assessing whether a person or individual was at risk of developing an eating disorder. However, a few concerns were brought up concerning the reliability and validity of this. To start, the study did find that the um, scale did not support invariance for factor loadings, which invariance means that um, a item is unchanged regardless of the conditions of the measurement which in simpler terms means that for different constructs between the black women and the white women, the E26 may have been assessing different concerns. And items were endorsed at a lower rate by black women compared to white women. Still, even with all that, this study was internally consistent and it had convergent validity. In relation to reliability and validity for gender, a study which looked at this did find that there was internal consistency in both men and women to a very high regard. 
meaning that the EAT-26 scale was really good at identifying thinness-oriented eating disorder symptoms among both groups. In fact, the internal consistency for women was 0.89, and for men it was 0.81. There was also no evidence of differential item functioning. The study was also taken from a fairly diverse population and suggests that the EAT-26 scale operates similarly among men and women with identifying thinness-oriented eating disorder symptoms. This was actually another study which looked at the difference between men and women and how they were scaled on the EAT-26. In this particular study, they more so looked at overall body image, sociocultural attitudes, and appearance anxiety and depression. Overall, they found that both men and women who experience higher body dissatisfaction also experience higher EAT-26 scores. And the percentage of body image dissatisfaction is almost the same with males at 65.2% and females at 68.6%. The study also showed high internal consistency on Combax Alpha, which you can see in the picture to the left, which is 0.82 for the EAT-26 scale. Among most of the topics addressed almost across the board, it was very similar between men and women, except for appearance anxiety. With appearance anxiety, there was almost no difference between men at risk for an eating disorder and men non at risk for an eating disorder. In comparison, appearance anxiety was really predictive for women. Overall, the E26 scale has been shown to have consistent internal consistency with a degree of 0.90. It has also been shown that over a three-week test retest, there is reliability of 0.86, and it can discriminate effectively between those with and without eating disorders. In terms of convex alpha, the internal consistency is 0.86 for many studies. This scale has also shown some convergent validity. Altogether, the E26 is pretty relatable to the real world. Taking social media as an example, because it is so available, people are able to see pictures of what society deems ideal body types are, and they internalize those feelings, maybe if they don't look like them, and it actually brings their confidence down. When a person feels body dissatisfaction, it puts them at a greater risk for developing an eating disorder in both men and women. To go along with this, a study actually looked at death anxiety, perfectionism, and disordered eating among people. And this study found that perfectionism on its own was pretty predictive of people developing an eating disorder, which also relates to social media and people being obsessed with how they look and how they appear to others. In terms of death anxiety, which a lot of people don't think about, it is a fear of death, and in many ways, it's a significant predictor of eating disorder pathology as it has been linked with anorexia nervosa with people who are diagnosed with this disorder have greater death anxiety than others. In fact, people who fear death have a higher correlated correlation with um, eating disorder diagnosis, which the EAT-26 was able to identify. In terms of limitations, there are about two limitations that stand out the most, with the first dealing with gender. In both studies, it was found that the comparison between men and women was pretty good. However, they did find on a couple of the men scales when they were answering that there were some drawbacks in the sense that the EAT-26 scale wasn't assessing the masculinity aspect and it was more centered toward thinness. While the EAT-26 scale was good at assessing thinness in both men and women, it didn't account for masculinity. When taking into account masculinity, there could be a difference in the level of scores or the level of men who feel or are predicted to maybe have a eating disorder. Secondly, in terms of race, it was also found that there was a good predictability in general of um, assessing both black women and white women in the study. With that said, on certain items, it was found that there was differential item functioning which is basically the extent to which an item might be measuring different abilities for members of separate subgroups. Because differential item functioning was found, it was speculated that certain items were not accounting for characteristics that were more concerning to black women in comparison to white women. And lastly, there are just a few concerns about factorial structures in a non-clinical setting for the EAT-26, which needs to be further researched. The final strengths of this scale is that it has long-term reliability and validity, and it is still widely used today. 
Also, in almost most cases, the self-report is usually good at predicting if a patient needs to seek out further help. In terms of a general assessment, this scale is also really good at assessing a variety of different people. In conclusion, this measure has pretty good validity and reliability. Despite some of the limitations, almost all of the studies found the E26 to be reliable in assessing eating behaviors and pathology. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you.